Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Uh, happy Tuesday. Hope you had a, an enjoyable Veterans Day. Uh, which reminds me which, uh, that, as you probably know by now, the President is enjoying lunch with service members at Molly Malone's, uh, an establishment here in Washington. Uh, in advance of the uh, annual dinner he'll be having with combatant commanders tonight. I have a couple of uh, toppers uh, to give to you. Uh, first, uh, I wanted to note that the First Lady delivered remarks today at Bell Multicultural High School, a high school in the Washington, D.C. area. The First Lady's remarks continued to expand her focus on issues of youth empowerment and education, in particular working to achieve the President's North Star goal that by the year 2020, America will once again have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world. In her remarks, the First Lady spoke directly to young people about committing to their education so that they can create a better future for themselves and their country. Uh, following the First Lady's remarks, uh, she would, uh, was participating in a conversation with the 10th grade class at Bell about her own personal story of working hard toward her education. Secretary of Education Arne Duncan, Duncan also uh, participated. Secondly, I wanted to note that at 5.30 p.m. today, the Senate will have a cloture vote on Nina Pillard, another of the President's three nominees to the D.C. Circuit Court. Pillard is an accomplished litigator and professor. Her career includes landmark uh, accomplishments on behalf of women and families, such as helping defend the constitutionality of the Family and Medical Leave Act and helping open the doors of the Virgin Virginia Military Institute to female students. It is time for Senate Republicans to stop playing politics with our courts. Fifteen of the last 19 judges confirmed to this court were nominated by Republican presidents. Fifteen of the last 19. But now that a Democratic president is fulfilling his constitutional duty and nominating judges, Republicans make cynical arguments in an effort to maintain an ideological edge. More of President Obama's nominees to the D.C. Circuit have been successfully filibustered than those of any other president in history. We urge the Senate to consider all of these nominations on their merits, starting with tonight's cloture vote for Nina Pillard. Finally, uh, I wanted to note a phone call the President had uh, earlier. Uh, this morning, President Obama spoke with President Aquino of the Philippines to express our deep condolences for the lives lost and damage caused by Super Typhoon Hayan Yolanda, one of the largest, strongest storms to ever hit land. Over the weekend, the President directed the administration to mount a swift and coordinated response to save lives and provide assistance to alleviate suffering. USAID and the Department of Defense are providing significant assistance to the people of the Philippines. Even before the storm reached land, USAID had deployed a disaster assistance response team to the area. After landfall, U.S. Marines were some of the first to help deliver supplies for the relief effort. American aircraft are delivering vital assistance and equipment. The United States is also providing food aid to feed tens of thousands of people in the coming days. Additionally, the aircraft carrier USS George Washington and several escort ships are on their way to the Philippines. On arrival, they will help expand search and rescue operations, provide medical care, and serve as platforms uh, uh, for a base of helicopters working to deliver supplies. Our State Department and USAID team on the ground is coordinating with local officials and other organizations, and in the days ahead, the United States will continue to work with the Philippines to deliver, deliver rather, whatever help we can as quickly as possible. And with that, I take your questions. Julie, I just want to remind people, I think we have a uh, preset for the President's announcement at 2 o'clock. Yes, Jay. Julie. Um, I wanted to get your reaction to a comment that President Clinton made in an interview that was posted today. He was talking about health care, and he said that President Obama should honor his commitment to people who have lost their health care or are losing their health care under the President's law, even if it means changing that law. Does the President agree with that comment? Well, I think as you saw the President say in an interview with NBC last week, the answer is yes. The President has tasked his team with uh, looking at a range of options. Uh, as he said, to make sure that nobody is put in a position uh, where their plans have been canceled and they can't afford a better plan, even though they'd like to have a better plan. Uh, so you heard the President address this very issue in his interview uh, last week. Uh, and I think it's important to note that President Clinton, in that interview, uh, also said, and I quote, the big lesson is that we are better off with this law than without it. 
and he said, quote, the enrollment period did not come off well because the national website wasn't ready. But this happened once before. It happened when President Bush put in the Medicare drug program for seniors, which was not as complicated, but had exactly the same problem with the rollout. It was a disaster. There were people that lost their prescriptions for their existing medicine, and they fixed it. So the President, as you know, is uh, pledged to uh, ask his team, task his team to, to, to look at potential uh, actions that could be taken to address this problem, uh, because his focus is on making sure that people get quality and affordable health insurance. But what the President said appears to be slightly different from what President Clinton said. President Clinton is, seems to be talking about anybody who's losing their plan, and, and what the President said and officials afterwards said was that they were focused more on people who were getting cancellations and then maybe weren't getting subsidies to cover higher premiums. So is what President Obama is looking at more narrow than Well, the certainly broader what the point we've made is that for more than half of those on the individual market who, because their plans were not grandfathered in, they did not exist or they were not participants in those plans prior to the passage of the Affordable Care Act, more than half of those individuals will have uh, higher quality insurance with uh, better basic protections at the same or lower cost. Uh, roughly half, uh, or maybe that is roughly half, more than half will qualify for a subsidy. Some will qualify for Medicaid in those states where Medicaid has been expanded. Uh, for the universe of people, uh, of you know, that smaller group of people within that, that uh, 5 percent of the population for whom the uh, fact that they've gotten a cancellation notice because they purchased plans perhaps in the last couple of years uh, that do not meet the minimum standards and they uh, are facing challenges in terms of affordability, the President has asked his team to, uh, to look at ways to address that problem. Uh, and that goes to the point he made about uh, the vast majority of Americans here uh, who, uh, if they're an employer provided insurance or Medicare or Medicaid or VA uh, will not have uh, any changes if they don't want them. In fact, the only changes they'll see uh, it, uh, have to do with improvements to benefits. On, a, on another point on health care, there are some reports out about enrollment numbers, putting them at about 40 to 50,000. Yes. Can you confirm that those numbers are accurate? And if not, can you tell us when the administration expects to put out numbers? Sure. I cannot confirm those numbers. Uh, you know, there have been a variety of reports saying a variety of different things. The administration will be releasing data about enrollment in the middle of the month. I, I anticipate it will be later this week, uh, as we've said all along, uh, consistent with the way that data like this is released for other programs. Uh, so I, I would add two things. First, it was always the case, even prior to the problems with the launch of the website, that enrollment in the first month would be low. Uh, that is the experience we saw in Massachusetts, uh, and it is the experience we expect here because, uh, especially for healthier, younger people, uh, the pattern of behavior is to shop around, to wait uh, before you purchase, uh, when you don't have to purchase before December 15th in order to have insurance on January 1st, which is the earliest possible date for coverage. Uh, so we expect that pattern to play out with the uh, marketplaces in the Affordable Care Act. Secondly, the fact that the website has been so challenging and so problematic in that first month uh, means that the enrollment numbers will be even lower than expected. But beyond that, I don't have specific figures. I have not seen specific figures, uh, but I anticipate that we will be releasing uh, data about enrollment uh, by the end of the week. But you don't have a specific date? I do not. Thanks, Jay. Um, the President spoke last week about gaps mm -hmm. and problems um, with the rollout of the website that needed to be fixed. What are those gaps and what fixes would you anticipate? Well, he was referring to, uh, and I'll quote, I've assigned my team to see what we can do to close some of the holes and gaps in the law. And he was addressing the issue of cancellations and, and some of the uh, concerns uh, that he has about individuals who've had their existing policies canceled. And that issue has obviously gotten a lot of attention. The, the problems with the website, which you just mentioned, uh, are being addressed by a team of tech experts, uh, as well as by Jeff Zients, who's overseeing that team. Uh, and they essentially have a punch list of problems that need to be fixed uh, in different areas of the website. And they've been working through that punch list and making progress, gradual progress each day. Uh, there's no question that the website is uh, functioning 
better today than it was uh, a week ago or 10 days ago, and, and certainly much better than it was in the first two weeks of October. Uh, but there is more work to be done, as Mr. Zients has said. Uh, so that work continues, and uh, our goal is to have that website functioning effectively for the vast majority of Americans by the end of this month. And if it's not uh, up to par by the end of the month, do you have a plan B in place, an alternative? We expect it to be functioning properly and effectively for the vast majority of Americans by the end of the month. What we uh, have been doing since the issues with the website arose, it, ha it has uh, focused, you know, we've been expanded our efforts to uh, create ways through which Americans can get more information about the options available to them, uh, both by uh, in-person consultations or over the phone. Uh, they can also apply and enroll by mail. Uh, so those efforts continue. But we expect, as uh, and I'm citing here those closer to the ground, that the site will be functioningly, functioning effectively by the end of the month for the vast majority of users. I, I think I said last week, and I would reiterate, and I think I said the week before, uh, that any website of this size and complexity will you know, occasionally have uh, issues with it. That's true of major websites today uh, in the commercial sphere. Uh, but we expect it to be functioning effectively for uh, the vast majority of, of users so that they can navigate through it, review their options, uh, find out whether or not they're eligible for tax credits, and choose uh, coverage uh, that fits their needs, both their financial needs and uh, their coverage needs. Can you say whether Todd Park will testify for Congress tomorrow? Uh, I can say a couple of things about that. First of all, I'd like to point out the administration's extraordinary cooperation with the six separate congressional committees uh, currently conducting oversight into the Affordable Care Act. As you have all seen and covered, administration officials have testified at numerous committee interviews and briefings. And they've testified at more than two dozen congressional hearings, including four in just the last two weeks. Uh, the administration has also produced thousands of pages of documents, and our cooperation on these issues continues. The subpoena issued by House Republicans on Friday is an unfortunate and unnecessary step since we made clear several times that Todd Park is willing to testify. Uh, the issue for us, us is not a question of if he will testify, but when we had hoped the committee would work with us to find an alternative date to give Mr. Park time to focus on his immediate task at hand, which is getting the website fixed. This is a goal that is ostensibly shared by the very House Republicans now demanding his appearance on Wednesday, uh, an appearance that would take him away from his work on the website. In fact, Chairman Issa told CBS News a few weeks ago that he wanted the website fixed and, quote, fixed quickly. Well, Todd Park is uh, very much engaged in the effort of fixing it as quickly as possible. So uh, I have no update on that except to tell you that the Office of Science and Technology has said they are reviewing the subpoena and they will respond as appropriate. Can I just ask about uh, Iran? Sure. Um, Iran's, uh, I guess, foreign minister has uh, sort of rejected the, the claim that it was Iran that was the result of the failure to reach an agreement in Geneva recently and has said that divisions among Western nations was, uh, were the cause of the failure of the talks. Can you comment on that? Is it really uh, up to the, the West to... Well, what I can tell you is simply that the P5 plus 1 were unified uh, on the proposal that was put forward uh, and that the uh, Iranians uh, did not accept that proposal. Uh, and that's a statement of fact. There was... Uh, important progress made at these uh, negotiations, and they, they were uh, cordial and substantive and serious. But as I said, the P5 plus one uh, were united there, and we remain united in our proposal to Iran and our approach to these negotiations. Uh, gaps remain, and there are still important issues to be addressed between the P5 plus one and Iran, uh, and that is why there will be a break, as you know, and the P5 plus one will resume negotiations with Iran on November 21st and 22nd. Uh, I want to caution everyone, because there's been a substantial amount of speculation about the details of the proposal, uh, against believing rumors and incorrect reports or prejudging outcomes. Both the P5 plus one and Iran have been very disciplined in keeping the details of the negotiations private 
and that is a sign of the seriousness of what is taking place, and it has also allowed us to make the progress that we have made. So we're not going to get into details about our uh, negotiating positions, uh, but to be clear, the purposes of these negotiations is to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon, and I think that's important. There's one objective here. The reason why we are here, the reason why negotiations are taking place is because uh, of the very focused effort in building an international cons consensus and building a punitive sanctions regime around uh, Iranian behavior and Iran's refusal to comply with its international obligations. Because of that effort, over e the several years since it's been in place, we now have a diplomatic opening. We have a willingness, because of the uh, concentrated effect of these sanctions, by Iran to pursue the possibility of resolving this diplomatically. Resolving this diplomatically is the best way to resolve it. It is the responsibility of the President to pursue a diplomatic opening. Because the best way to ensure that Iran does not acquire a nuclear weapon is to uh, achieve an agreement through diplomacy, uh, an agreement that's verifiable, that's transparent, and that requires Iran to take concrete steps. The alternative uh, is military action. The President has never taken any option off the table, and he does not now and will not. Uh, but it is his responsibility as President to pursue a diplomatic opening to see if it is possible to resolve this issue peacefully. Is there any assurance that Secretary Kerry can provide lawmakers on the Hill when he speaks to them uh, that would persuade them to hold off on tightening sanctions? Secretary Kerry and Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Wendy Sherman, are briefing the Senate Banking Committee tomorrow. Uh, that's part of a broader effort to consult with Congress and uh, update them on the P5 plus 1 negotiations, as well as uh, our consultations with our allies. But when it comes to the issue of new sanctions legislation, it's important to remember, no one is suggesting an open-ended delay for new sanctions, uh, because there may come a point where additional sanctions are necessary. At the same time, it is important for Congress to reserve its ability to legislate for the moment when it is most effective in order to give the current P5 plus 1 negotiations the best chance to make real progress in achieving our shared goal of preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. So again, this is not about being for or against sanctions. This administration has imposed the most crippling sanctions in history against Iran. And we appreciate the leverage those sanctions have given us, and we appreciate the uh, partnership that Congress has given us in that effort. But this is a decision to support diplomacy and a possible peaceful resolution to this issue. The American people, justifiably and understandably, prefer a peaceful solution that prevents Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. And this agreement, if it's achieved, has the potential to do that. The American people do not want a march to war. And it is important to understand that if pursuing a resolution diplomatically is, for, is, is uh, disallowed or ruled out, what options then do we and our allies have to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon? We've said all along, as we have ratcheted up sanctions and increased the isolation and pressure on Tehran, uh, that the window for resolving this diplomatically uh, was open, but that it would not remain open forever. And uh, short of a, an agreement, Iran will continue to make progress in its nuclear program. So uh, we need to pursue this. We need to see if Iran is serious, and uh, any deal that we uh, and the P5 uh, might reach with Iran will be one that absolutely meets our standards uh, that would uh, be verifiable and concrete. Any uh, initial relief as part of the first phase would be reversible and modest. Uh, it would not in any way change the sanctions architecture that's in place, uh, but it would allow for essentially putting some time on the clock because it would halt Iran's program and roll back aspects of its program. And if it doesn't do that, the United States won't agree to it. Jim. Hey, I 
Uh, getting back to former President Clinton's comments, uh, you, you were saying at the beginning of the briefing that the President does agree with what former President Clinton said, but, you know, uh, former President Clinton did say, I personally believe even if it takes a change in the law, the President should honor the commitment the federal government made. So the President agrees even if it takes a change in the law? That well, what I, what, I, what, what, what I just said, Jim, is that the President uh, has instructed his team to look at uh, a range of options, and we haven't announced one way or the other, uh, although, understandably, uh, you and others ask us for details on what is under consideration. We haven't announced uh, any uh, potential fixes or uh, moves that we might be able to make to address this problem, but the President is, uh, as you heard him say in his interview with uh, NBC, he's very interested in trying to address this problem and uh, looks forward to being presented the options that uh, he might be able to pursue. But wouldn't you be in a situation where you if you were trying to help people keep the plans that they have now, wouldn't you might be trying to put the toothpaste back in the tube in that, you know, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of Americans have received these notifications already. How do you go back and allow those people to keep those, those insurance plans? That just seems practically impossible. Well, uh, what I would say, uh, Jim, is that I'm not going to get into specifics about avenues that might be available to the President to address this problem uh, until uh, he's chosen. Uh, which option he wants to pursue. Yeah. The broader thing that we have to remember here is that the overall majority, uh, overwhelming majority rather, of the American people either get their insurance through their employers uh, and will not see a change, get their insurance through Medicare or Medicaid uh, or the VA and will not see a change, except for those changes that improve the coverage they get and improve the benefits they get because they apply to everyone not just those who purchase plans in the marketplaces. Uh, others, as you know, because uh, some states have making, made the, uh, the, the decision to help their own constituents, their own people, by expanding the Medicaid program under the Affordable Care Act, uh, will extend insurance to hundreds of thousands, millions of Americans uh, on, uh, who will become newly eligible for Medicaid, and then others will be able to find an array of options available to them for purchase through the marketplaces. Now, uh, that effort, uh, in terms of the shopping period, has been made more difficult, frustratingly so, because of the problems with the website. But uh, there is a, a team focused daily, seven days a week, on making improvements to that website so the American people have uh, a better experience while they're shopping for plans and uh, registering and enrolling uh, for coverage. And getting back to the interview that the President did with NBC, he apologized to people who were losing their plans <coughs> despite the, insur the assurances he gave. Uh, but, but what about uh, whether or not the, the statement itself was misleading? If you, if you like your plan, you can keep it. Uh, the Senate uh, whip, uh, Dick Durbin, was on CNN earlier today, and he said uh, that uh, perhaps if a couple of sentences had been added to the end of that pledge, that might have clarified things. Mm -hmm. Does the President agree with that? That well, he was not I, precise look, the enough? President gave a pretty extensive interview in which this was the central topic of discussion, and I would point you to what he said. He obviously uh, expressed regret about uh, the fact that uh, the law has not uh, addressed uh, some of these individuals uh, the way that he would like, uh, and therefore he has asked his team to uh, come up with some solutions uh, that he can review. Um, so the overall effort here has to be on implementing the Affordable Care Act, standing up the marketplaces so that these millions of Americans uh, are presented with the far better options that the Affordable Care Act allows them uh, for affordable quality health insurance, for many of whom uh, that's something that's been out of reach for a long time. Uh, and, you know, he is focused on getting it right uh, because it is a fact that come January 1st, there will be millions more Americans with insurance coverage who didn't have it before, and there'll be uh, millions, uh, uh, other millions of Americans who will have higher quality insurance than they had before. They won't uh, be subjected to uh, a marketplace in which insurers could uh, charge Juliana double for the same plan that you got because she's a woman. Uh, they can't uh, put a lifetime or annual cap on the benefits that you receive. Uh, they can't, uh, you know, carve out exemptions for certain conditions, chronic conditions that you might have that you might need uh, benefits to cover. So uh, 
uh, you know, th that is the underlying purpose of the Affordable Care Act, to make sure that there's a structure in place uh, that creates higher competition under the private sector model that we've had, uh, keeps down prices, and allows millions of Americans to get access to affordable quality insurance and health care that they have not had in the past. And on those enrollment numbers, is the administration confident that those numbers will be accurate, uh, given all the problems with the insurers being able to sort through the data and, and, and figure out which applications are, are correct and, and properly submitted and so forth? Well, I know that they're going to work very hard uh, over at uh, CMS and HHS to compile the data and uh, present the most accurate da data available. I think that's a good question in light of the fact that you know, some on Capitol Hill have been uh, demanding data daily, and uh, you know we've made the point that, consistent with the release of data for other programs, it uh, is in the interests uh, of everybody to do this on a monthly basis so that the data is as accurate as possible. John. Jay, you've been crystal clear the number's going to be low for the first month. I is there any number that would concern the White House? Is there any number that is so low? That well, I can guarantee you that the number that is released uh, will be lower than we had hoped and anticipated because of the problems with the website. And that is why it is so important to focus our energies on fixing the problems. And that goes to the subpoena we were talking about earlier, and the attempt to remove somebody who's very much a key part of the effort to fix the website from his job for a certain amount of time. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it raises questions about how sincere critics are when it comes to uh, joining with us in the effort to try to fix the problems that exist. But I, I guess what I'm asking, all that said, you made it very clear, as I said, but is there any number that would be so low that you would say, wow, alarm bells are going off, we have a problem? Again, John, I, I, I think it's a very creative way to try to uh, set expectations, and the only expectations I'll set is, is, is that uh, we expect them to be low. We expected them to be low as a percentage of uh, the overall number of people who would enroll by the end of the six-month period in any case, because that is the experience that we've seen in Massachusetts uh, and in similar kinds of programs. Younger, healthier people especially tend to wait until the last minute to enroll in, in these kinds of programs. And uh, overall, I think, whether you're young or old, if, uh, if you don't have to enroll until a certain time, you, you're going to take your time to look at your options and, and wait until uh, late in the process. That was certainly what happened in Massachusetts. And when you're defining enrollment, uh, there's been some reporting about how the numbers be. Are, are, are you going to be including people who have picked out a health care plan and put it in their shopping cart but haven't actually paid for it? Uh, I would refer you to HHS and CMS for how they define enrollment. I can tell you that it is consistent with the way Massachusetts did it. It is consistent th with the way the states are doing it. The marketplace uh, experience or process ends when a person selects a plan, you know, essentially presses enroll in a plan. And after that, it becomes uh, a contract between the private insurer and the individual. So uh, the process they're using, as I understand it, will be consistent with what Massachusetts did and with what the states are doing. Uh, and uh, more details, obviously, will be available when those uh, data are released. Is, is the number of people who enroll going to be lower than those that have been receiving cancellation notices? John, I would simply ask you to wait until the uh, data are released. I think it's fair to say that the enrollment figures will be low, and we're going to be low anyway. They will be significantly lower because of the challenges uh, posed by the faulty website. What will that say? I mean, what kind of a message is that if more people have received cancellation notices than have actually been able to enroll? I would say that uh, it would say two things. One, the history of these kinds of programs, uh, and Massachusetts is the best model, show that uh, enrollment is very slow early on. I think there were only 123 people in Massachusetts who enrolled in the first month. And while it's a small state, it's a reasonably populous state, and 123 is a very low number. Uh, in the end, I think more than 36,000 people enrolled in Massachusetts. So I think as a, as a guidepost, I think that's a pretty good indicator, even without troubles with the website, of what kind of uh, sort of phased-in process of enrollment we're likely to see. That lowness will be undoubtedly compounded by the uh, problems with the website that have made it so much harder for individuals to uh, shop and enroll. And just a clarification on the mm -hmm. Bill Clinton, he, he said even if it takes 
changes to the law. Is the White House open to legal changes to a act of Congress to address this issue? All I can say at this point, John, is that the President has asked his team to come up with a range of options, and we're not uh, focused on any particular one. We're looking at uh, ones that uh, effectively address the problem. Those that have been described here are within the context of the law and working with state insurance commissioners. Is that the orbit the President is looking at and asked his team, meaning they don't include seeking a change to the law that would have to go through Congress? Because people who have talked to me about it believe the legislative climate is just too difficult to look in that direction. Well, I would beg your indulgence and give you the same answer I just gave John, which is that at, at, at this time the President has asked his team to look at the options uh, that might be available to pursue. And once we have an announcement to make, we'll, we'll make one. Uh, the, I think it's fair to say that he wants to address this problem uh, and uh, have as many people who are affected here helped as possible. And so he would look for an option that is effective rather than one that uh, cannot be achieved. Would you acknowledge that that's going to be hard to do? People who are experts in this area have said, Insurance policies have already gone out. It's very difficult to retroactively, as Jim mentioned, uncancel something. You need state insurance regulatory permission to do that. That's why you need to have these conversations with the state insurance commissioners. And the law itself has very defined poverty levels, 400%. Mm -hmm. If you are above that, how do you create a new subsidy tranche for people who don't fall into that income category that's just defined by the law? Mm -hmm. I mean, this seems like a very difficult thing for you to handle outside of a legislative fix. Would you acknowledge that? Well, I think in general these issues are challenging, which is why uh, it took a century of effort uh, for it to come to fruition, the passage of comprehensive health insurance reform. Uh, and you described some of the general challenges that are out there. I, I would uh, send you over to CMS and their daily briefing for more details. My guess is they're going to ask uh, that you wait for details about what the President's going to decide into, until, well, probably not to send you over here, but simply say what, what I can tell you, which is that we're, uh, I, I'm not really going to discuss in any detail the options the President might be considering because uh, when he makes a decision, we'll let you know. And just to clarify, because it's been described this way to me, what the President's looking at is for those who are in the individual market who don't qualify for subsidies, but that their premiums are higher than they can afford. This is kind of a to use your phraseology from the past, a slice of a slice of a slice. Is that what, I think what, that, what, uh, what the President I, is trying and has to I don't want to, to I, I don't want to overly define the universe because that's work that's being done by uh, policy experts, but I think that, that, is that you, a fair well I think it's a, it's, a, it's a fair characterization of uh, people who are uh, most affected by this problem. Obviously, if you are uh, if you're somebody who enrolled in uh, a plan and you now have a uh, the and paid for it and it was a substandard plan and now you're eligible for Medicaid right, because you so so what I'm saying is it's obviously not every individual uh, in the individual market today uh, but beyond that I'm not going to get into defining the, the population here I'll, I'll let the policy experts for this. Uh, I don't have a timeline for it except the president uh, asked for something and when he asked for something people tend to work on it pretty quickly Very good. Uh, on Haran, uh, quickly it sounded here Thursday as if you had rhetoric to describe what you thought might happen, and it didn't happen. Um, and the theory behind what was trying to be accomplished in Geneva was sort of a cap on a cap. The Iranians cap where they are, and the, the P5 plus 1 agrees to cap sanctions. That's a general formulation I've seen as describing what was being sought. What, is that still the goal? Or, or did this experience in Geneva make the U.S. and the P5 plus one reconsider this idea of, init of an initial agreement that would, pre that would come before a much bigger one? It is our approach and the P5 plus one's approach to uh, essentially phase this in in two phases. The, the first phase would halt progress on Iran's uh, nuclear program and roll back key aspects of the program. The, the second component of that, uh, the relief component, would the only relief we would consider would be limited, it would be temporary, and it would be reversible. 
we would take no steps, and this addresses the cap on sanctions, it would take no steps that undermine the architecture of our sanctions regime. I think I described it last week as, uh, you know, essentially a spigot that you could, you know, turn down a little bit or turn up, but it would be something that would be easily reversible. It would be uh, temporary, and it would uh, require steps taken by Iran to halt progress on its nuclear program and to roll back certain aspects of it. And I can tell you that the, the areas uh, that we are concerned about, our most serious concerns, are the possibility of Iran producing a sufficient quantity of highly enriched uranium for one nuclear weapon, which is commonly referred to as a breakout capability. Two, the possibility of Iran stockpiling, stockpiling centrifuges or increasing the efficiency of those of the centrifuges they have. Uh, also, Iran's ability to produce plutonium using the Iraq reactor. Uh, and finally, bringing unprecedented transparency and monitoring of Iran's program. So those are the four areas uh, around which the negotiations are focused when it comes to actions, concrete actions, that the P5 plus 1 uh, is asking Iran to take. Uh, and when, again, when it comes to the relief component of this, it would, it's very important to be clear. The sanctions regime stays in place. We built the regime working with our allies, the most punishing uh, regime in history. Uh, and it has had a profound effect, and it has created this opportunity, potentially, for resolving this uh, international challenge diplomatically. We ought to pursue that option, pursue that opportunity, uh, but as Secretary Kerry and the President and others have made clear, uh, you know, we will only reach an agreement, we and the other members of the P5 plus 1 with Iran, if it's uh, a good deal that ensures uh, concrete Iranian actions uh, that are verifiable uh, and transparent. You asked a rhetorical question a few moments ago. What options then do we have? This is the chief executive of the president of the United States, the commander in chief. He knows the answer to that question. No question. And, and the president has made abundantly clear throughout his presidency that he takes no options off the table. And that remains true today when it comes to dealing with the potential for Iran acquiring a nuclear weapon. But it is his responsibility to pursue a diplomatic resolution of this problem if one is available. And we have to test whether or not it is available. It is in the interests of the American people that we do that. Alternatively, if pursuing a diplomatic opening is something that some say we should not do, they ought to be explicit about the fact that they're suggesting the only alternative is use of force. Uh, the President believes that we should never take the use of force off the table, but that it is his responsibility as Commander-in-Chief, his responsibility as President, uh, to take advantage of the impact of this comprehensive sanctions regime and the opening it has created to see if Iran is serious about resolving this peacefully. One last question. It was credibly reported last week that already the administration had slightly eased up on some of the financial sanctions, Josh Rogan reported that last week. Can you categorically say whether or not any softening or easing of the sanctions has been undertaken in order to signal to the Iranians that this would be a worthwhile endeavor for them to engage in? I'm certainly not aware of that, and I would refer you to Treasury when it comes to financial matters. The fact is the sanctions regime uh, is in place and is, it is extremely broad uh, and punishing and effective. Uh, again, the specific programs function in different ways. So for specifics about those programs uh, this, that especially deal with uh, financial matters and in institutions, I would refer you to Treasury. But there has certainly been no, uh, no agreement reached that would provide any kind of relief with the Iranians. Uh, as you know, there was not an agreement in Geneva. There was progress, and it was a uh, productive and substantive uh, cordial series of negotiations, and very serious. But there's only uh, even moderate, modest relief if uh, the Iranians agree to concrete actions. Jay, the President troubled by security concerns uh, uh, in the healthcare.gov website, which one CMS memo would describe as a limitless? Uh, I think you are elliptically referring to the selectively released uh, memo to CBS that uh, by the committee, even in, in the habit that it tends to embrace, uh, which had to do with portions of the website that are not and will not be operative until the spring. Uh, so the uh, fact of the matter is, 
security is a, a constant issue that is addressed. Uh, the uh, head of uh, CMS and others have uh, discussed this in their uh, in their testimony, and you know it is absolutely imperative, and we go through this process rigorously to ensure that security is maintained so that people's personal data uh, is protected. Uh, and that is uh, the case, and it will continue to be the case. Does he support Senator Hagan's call for an investigation of cost overruns? I'm sorry, I haven't seen that. Uh, Jay, if I can very quickly, getting back to what President Clinton said, he said that he thought the President should honor the commitment and let them keep what they've got. So just to be very clear, is the President's commitment to try to look for fixes to let people keep the plans that they already have or to accommodate them in terms of new plans they would be required to get through Obamacare? Peter, I, I, I'm not going to review the options available to the President. I'm going to let him review those options and, and make a decision about how we want to move forward on this issue, which uh, he said on your network is one that concerns him. Uh, once a decision is made, we'll let you know. Uh, we spoke with one of the architects of both the plan, the Massachusetts health care system and the Obamacare health care system, who said a variety of things and basically said that if some people are allowed to stay on their old plans and other people are then forced to get on the Obamacare system because they didn't have any coverage, then the whole system collapses, basically. There's no way to balance both. Does the White House acknowledge that there is no way to make both of those work? Well, it's written into the law that those with uh, grandfathered plans can can stay on those plans indefinitely. So I think that would... To, I'm referring to the additional people, people who presently have plans through 2013, so after the March 2010 date through 2013. Mm -hmm. In other words, if the President tries to accommodate for saying, if you like your plan, you can keep your plan, and says, you bought your plan in July of 2012, I didn't mean it to come out that way, but I'm going to let you keep your plan. According to the architects of both plans in Massachusetts and the federal plan, the system would collapse. It creates an imbalance. Well, Does the White House concede that much? All I would say is I think this gets to some of the proposed legislation, that any, any fix that would essentially uh, open up for insurers the ability to sell new plans that did not meet standards uh, would create more problems than it fixed, because it would essentially uh, allow insurers to offer plans that charged women double or uh, didn't cover basic services or imposed caps. Uh, and, and, and then charge prices that undercut the prices of other plans that kept to the uh, basic so coverage. Well, but, but Peter, I think, again, the law as written allowed for the grandfathering in of any plan if somebody wanted to keep it that was in existence prior to the passage of the law. So uh, obviously there is some capacity for that. It's also true, depending on the state and what's allowed by state insurance rules, uh, that uh, insurers had the option and insured individuals on the mar individual market had the option of uh, taking early renewal of existing individual insurance plans. Uh, but that obviously depends on the state and depends on the insurance company. Some insurance companies haven't offered those early renewals as I understand it. So, so I, I think it's a little, uh, I know that muddies up the, the clarity of your question, but the clarity of your question doesn't really apply to the, to the, uh, to the pretty complex circumstances here. And then very quickly, you said a little bit earlier that uh, while you're considering potential actions right now and while the desire is that by the end of the month, the vast majority of Americans will be able to enroll through the website. I guess the question very simply is right now, is the White House telling Americans who are considering enrolling right now they should not go to the website, do not begin that effort until December 1st? Or are you saying, hey, try it. I can't promise you it'll work right now. Well, we've been saying all along that the website has uh, functioned at a sub effective level since October 1st, but there have been those who have been able to uh, enroll, shop. Is and the message, as the, is a good use of your time right now, or is the message well, I, waiting? I, I think every, uh, every individual ought to avail himself or herself of the options uh, that are presented here in terms of getting information. It is certainly uh, a good place to go if you want to shop for, look at your, the options broadly that you have, type in your zip code. and and other data. Safe, does the information get through accurately? Is it fair to tell those people that it, it's safe and the information it will is, get through it is, accurately? It is safe, and I would refer you to CMS and HHS for more details. But the fact is, uh, again, why somebody was just citing reports of enrollment figures. The fact is, whatever the numbers are that we release, people are getting enrolled. They are simply having a much more difficult time because of the website than 
uh, is acceptable, and that's why we have to make sure that the website improvements continue uh, so that the, you said the vast majority of the American people, okay, I think you I'm meant sure the vast majority of Americans who want to uh, explore their options on the marketplaces, uh, which are really designed for about 15 percent of the American people, are able to do so. New York Times. Um, so just one last time to make sure I understand. Forget about what the president's options are. Can you just clarify for us what the problem is he wants to solve? Is it helping people keep their insurance, or is it helping people afford new insurance that they are going to be still required to get? Uh, Those are not, that doesn't have anything to do with what the options are that are in front of him. Which is the problem that he's pledging to fix? I think you heard the president address this in his interview. So tell uh, me. Uh, <laughs> I think it's, it's pretty clear that the president is concerned about those individuals who uh, find themselves because they either purchased insurance in the last year or, or, or two since the Affordable Care Act uh, passed or there's been so much churn in the market that their plans were changed and downgraded. Uh, and they are uh, confronted with a situation where even though the coverage is better, uh, the, the cost uh, may be a challenge for them. I'm not going to define the affected population here more specifically because I think I, I want to let the policy people do that who are looking at the options here. But it, but it sounds like you're, I mean, without necessarily saying it I'm 100%, simply stating, it sounds like you're, you're heading towards that latter piece where you're saying well, I, the real concern here is the affordability question and that, that the, the direction you guys are heading is you know, we're not going to let people keep substandard plans, which frankly you guys have always railed against anyway and say that they're awful. So we're not going to let people keep those. We're simply going to find a way somehow with extra subsidies or something, which are the options that you're not talking about, mm -hmm. to fix the affordability question. I think that you've accurately diagnosed the problem that is most concerning to the President. How he assesses the options available for addressing that problem, uh, I will leave to him and to the experts who are compiling the options. The, what is not, I think, a, an effective fix uh, is one that, as envisioned on the Hill by some legislation, that would simply tell insurers that they can sell substandard plans to anybody who might purchase them because that would uh, cause more problems and create more problems and do more harm uh, than uh, any good it would do for, for individuals in this market who might be affected. Quick question on a different subject. Does the President still retain full confidence in Mr. Clapper uh, going forward with DNI? Uh, there was some suggestion in some article today in our paper that. Uh, <laughs> some, like you make it sound like something on a, a blog, and you know. Uh, the President does, yes. Jay, can I just follow up on what we were just talking about? Because you're addressing the legislation, are you, can you clarify? The President is saying that Senator Landrieu's approach and Congressman Upton's approach, which is gaining some Democratic sponsors, is, in his view, the wrong approach to resolve the problem of those who got uh, transition letters in the individual market. What I would tell you is that the Upton bill allows insurers to sell 2013 plans in 2014 to anyone. It does not just continue 2013 plans in 2014 for people enrolled in those plans. That creates uh, the problem that I just described and creates all sorts of problems for insurers who are trying to sell plans that meet the basic standards uh, and, uh, you know, and it allows those insurers who would sell those 2013 plans that either uh, charge you double or put caps on uh, benefits or, or do any of a number of things that make those plans um, insufficient when it comes to basic coverage. Uh, and, and basically sell them to any takers. And obviously, if the coverage is substandard, they would uh, at least potentially be able to undersell those plans and, and undermine uh, the basic premise of the Affordable Care Act, which is to provide basic benefits uh, affordable for affordable quality health insurance for everyone. And the same would be the case for the Senate? I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't have the details on that. I would just say that, broadly speaking, uh, that applies to the Upton legislation, that, broadly speaking, that we do not see that as uh, fixing the problem, we see that as throwing the uh, you know baby out with the bathwater. Practical follow-up: You were talking earlier about the president's desire to find an option that would be effective. You know that this population of people, however small it may be, have until practically December 15th, relatively speaking, mm -hmm. to try to find new insurance January 1. 
Some people have suggested that even if the president had the legal authority to, to expand the, the subsidies, in other words, to change the income levels, if he were able to do that through executive action, that would have to be programmed in to healthcare.gov. New software would have to be written, new coding, all that. As part of the effective, is the president open to the idea of any kind of option that would change healthcare.gov in the next month? Alexis, I think those and other questions are uh, excellent, but I will stick to what I said before, which is I'm not going to describe or get into detail uh, about the specific options available to the president that his team is working on. Once the president reviews those options and makes some decisions, we'll have an announcement for you. Let me move around a little. Yeah. April. When he was interviewed by Chuck Todd, talked about how federal regulations guided um, the website construction. Are fe federal regulations um, prohibiting a new, uh, a total new creation of a whole new website to uh, kind of eradicate what's going on now and just just bring out something new before the 30th or on the 30th of November? Uh, I, I don't think that's what he was saying. Uh, but for more details about the regulations that govern. The creation of these uh, of a federal website, I would have to refer you to CMS to start because they obviously uh, ha are, take the lead on this one. Uh, I think that there are issues with, as the president discussed in his interview, with federal IT programs and and uh, that uh, have been a persistent problem. Uh, but that's sort of a, a related but bigger issue uh, that I know concerns the president. Does the White House now wish uh, they would have followed some of the uh, conversations and the guides from some leaders on Capitol Hill who suggested that you do not focus primarily on the website, use more navigators, more phone, more uh, grassroots help to get people involved uh, in or enrolled in ACA? Well, I think that that's always been part of the effort, uh, the broad effort to uh, get information to people, get educate, uh, uh, you know, edu help educate people about the options available to them and the benefits available to them. It was never just limited to the website. Uh, I think what the president uh, believes is that the website uh, should be working more effectively and should have been working more effectively on October 1st. It's an important portal through which uh, Americans across the country uh, should be able to and will be able to uh, get information that they need and enroll uh, in, affordable, uh, in affordable insurance plans. In the initial offering, October 1st, uh, you had <coughs> the momentum there. You, you had everyone looking at it. Do you think that you've lost that momentum uh, now that there are so many glitches and it's found out that, you know, there's been low enrollment? Do you think you've lost that momentum for people? I would say that there's no question that this has created a challenge. And we have to work even harder to make sure that uh, those Americans who have benefits available to them through the Affordable Care Act and through the marketplaces are getting the information they need so that they can make decisions about their insurance coverage. Uh, so that's on us, and we're working hard uh, to make sure that happens. The goal here has always been not an effective uh, website so much as an effective marketplace for Americans to get the quality, affordable health insurance that they deserve. I mean, it is the, the criticism of the website is legitimate. It is a problem. It is frustrating. And the president uh, is more frustrated than anyone about it, as he has said. And that's why he's uh, tasked this team of experts to make the fixes necessary to bring it up to standard. It is important throughout this to remember what uh, the status quo looks like, to remember what the health insurance marketplace looked like in the United States and why a century of presidents engaged in efforts to try to reform it. You know, this was, this was, it's important to remember that uh, prior to the passage of the Affordable Care Act, health care inflation uh, was uh, astronomical and, you know, I increasing at a rate that made it unsustainable uh, for employers and individuals and for the government in the long term. Something needed to be done and is being done to bring those that cost growth under control. And do not forget that even as we have these challenges with the website and other challenges associated with the standing up of the marketplaces, that since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, we've had the three years of slowest 
growth in health care costs ever recorded, essentially in a half a century. And that has extreme benefits for the long term, for individuals, for the government, and for em private employers. And, it, and in the meantime, we're going to get the website right, and we're going to get the marketplaces right, and we're going to make sure that the goal here is achieved, which is to deliver the benefits to the American people that the Affordable Care Act promises. And if we do that, and millions of Americans who were not insured have insurance, and other Americans who were underinsured, who had crummy insurance, uh, have better coverage, then we will have achieved the objective. Because coupled with the reduced, the reduction in the growth of health care costs and the expansion of affordable quality insurance to the American people, uh, we will have achieved what the Affordable Care Act set out to do and what this President set out to do and what, and, and, and against, you know, some, some pretty entrenched establishment interests here. Uh, there's a reason why it hasn't been achieved in the past, because a lot of forces fought against it and, and citing President Clinton is absolutely appropriate uh, and it's important to remember that he tried this, he tried to reform our, our health insurance market. And uh, that effort was blocked. So, you know, the American people deserve quality, affordable health insurance. They deserve the certainty of knowing that they will not go bankrupt because they get sick. That's the goal here. The implementation of this website, not meeting anybody's standards here. And we admit that, and it's a problem, and we're fixing it. But don't forget the goal, don't forget the objective. Uh, Juliana. Cleveland on uh, Thursday to deliver a speech on the economy. Do you have any more details of what exactly uh, he's going to be? I'm sure uh, we will uh, provide more details as we get closer to the day. Uh, the President obviously is very focused on uh, the steps we need to take to continue uh, the economic growth that we've seen and to expand it, uh, to continue the creation of high quality jobs for the middle class. Uh, you know, we've been creating jobs uh, at a pace of more than two million a year. We need to keep doing that as an economy uh, and to increase that pace uh, because uh, and that's his number one ob objective here is his top priority uh, when he wakes up every morning is you know what steps are we taking to uh, you know make the investments that are necessary to create the jobs that we need uh, to make the middle class more secure and to have our economy grow uh, and I think that it's important to remember as we talk about bigger bu budget issues that Growth and job creation are the President's focus. On his watch, we've reduced the deficits by half. Don't forget that when he came into office, and this is before the passage of the Affordable, uh, or, or the, uh, the American Recovery Act, he inherited the largest deficits in history and a cascading economic catastrophe. And in order to forestall a depression, legislation was passed uh, that included some temporary spending that increased even more the deficit. But the fact is, on his watch, the deficits have been cut in half. And we need to continue that work, but we need to focus first and foremost on growth and job creation. Cheryl. Alberta Premier Allison Redford is here in town to uh, lobby for the Keystone Pipeline. Um, is she going to be meeting with anyone here at the White House? And can you characterize the President's thinking after all this time? Um, is he leaning for or against? I, I don't have any meetings uh, to announce and or any new developments on that issue, which is being how is, is housed and being addressed over at the State Department. And I would refer you to them for uh, any progress reports. Thanks, Jay. I'll do one more. Jerry, yeah. yeah. Jay, uh, in light of uh, President Clinton's comments, to, a year ago he was being called the Secretary of Explaining Stuff by the President. Is he still uh, a Metatron for the President's policies on health care? Uh, <laughs> I, I think I would point you to the uh, answers I gave in the seven or eight previous questions uh, to this uh, all along these lines and simply say that uh, President Clinton said something uh, that as the explainer-in-chief, 
uh, he would know, which is that the big lesson, and I quote, is that we are better off with this law than without it. And that goes to what I was saying in answer to April's question. The goal here is to achieve what President Clinton and presidents both Democratic and Republican sought to achieve in the past, which is to reform our health care system in a way that builds on the private sector system that we have, that makes it more affordable uh, with better coverage for more Americans. And that's what the Affordable Care Act does. And it does it while reducing health care cost inflation, uh, which has enormous benefits to our overall economy. Um, so the President himself addressed the issue of uh, cancellations in the interview he gave last week. And I would point you to what he said. And I think it's consistent with what uh, the spirit of what President Clinton was saying today. But President Clinton knows from experience. Uh, and some of the same folks who fought him tooth and nail successfully in the end uh, are still in Congress fighting the Affordable Care Act uh, today. And they didn't then and they don't now have an alternative. They do not have an alternative to the Affordable Care Act that would uh, make sure that you, have a uh, that you have coverage even if you have a pre-existing condition, to, that would make sure that insurers can't charge you double if you're a woman, uh, that would provide free preventive services uh, that are so essential to the long-term health of the nation and to every individual who benefits from them. So, you know, this is tough work, but the goal here is what the President remains focused on. If Thanks very much, everybody. If the House doesn't take up and pass, and is the President going to sign the executive order? Look, we, we believe very strongly, I appreciate the question, that uh, the time to pass that legislation has come that those who oppose passage of ENDA in the House and throw up a lot of reasons why, the reasons they cite are reasons that we've heard in the past in opposition to seminal civil rights legislation. And those who opposed previous civil rights legislation were wrong and history has proved them wrong. And those who oppose passage of ENDA are wrong and history will prove them wrong. Thank you.